Good afternoon, Robert Scribbler. It is August 20th, 2018. Thank you for joining me for another climate change and clean energy video blog. Now for this segment, I'm gonna do part one of a three-part segment on a study that was produced in early August that has received a lot of feedback, have already talked a bit about some of the implications in this study as it was discussed in media, but I'm gonna drill down quite a bit more because I think this study is a very important study in that it represents a shift in the scientific perspective as it relates to human-caused climate change. The study is entitled Trajectories of the Earth System in the Anthropocene. And what it does is it takes a, a broad look at both the human drivers of climate change and the various potential tipping points that we could cross in a relatively short period and potentially lock in various different and, and various different extreme hothouse states. And for the first part of, of my analysis, I'm going to be looking at at trajectory specifically for part two, I'm going to be looking at feedbacks and tipping points. And for part three, I'm going to be looking at response. Now, when we talk about trajectory, trajectory is a, is a, is a word that, that we often associate with a, with a, with a ballistic missile launch or, or, a, or a rocket launch into space it, it, or, or potentially the path of, of a ship as, as we're going through the ocean. So, but what trajectory basically is, is, is our, our present direction and, and the present speed at which we are heading in that direction. Oftentimes people think of trajectory just as direction, but, but there's, a, there's a velocity element to trajectory as well. So thinking about the Earth system in general, the Earth has cycled between periods of glaci glaciation and interglaciation swinging back and forth for about the past 1.2 million years. And this, these swings have been regulated both by the level of atmospheric greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere and by the Earth's interaction and the Earth system's interaction to small changes in the solar cycle. Greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere have ranged between about 175 parts per million to 250, 275 parts per million in the interglacial, in interglacial periods and with the glacial periods showing the lower levels of carbon dioxide. And these interactions have generated a relatively stable climate and a, a healthy Earth system to which present life is now evolved. But the massive burning of, of fossil fuels primarily and, and other forms of carbon emission due to human activity have pushed the Earth system increasingly to the edge and, and likely to the outside of the glaciation interglaciation range, such that we are now in a situation where the Earth is unlikely to, to experience an ice age ever again. And unless there is some kind of radical change that, that we as human beings generate with the Earth system, the amount of atmospheric CO2 and the rest of the atmospheric greenhouse gases has generated a situation where we are well outside the glaciation context, and we are entering a period quite rapidly where we could accelerate into a hothouse Earth state. And the reason why we're, we're heading rapidly into that, peri into that potential period where we cross planetary thresholds is because we are emitting carbon into the atmosphere at a rate that is approximately 10 times faster than at any time in geological history. Basically meaning that humans are really good at digging up carbon and burning it, much more efficient than volcanoes have ever been or any other Earth system process. And, and this is speeding us toward 
a on a geological pace toward toward a situation where the Earth system could rapidly change, and various subsets of the Earth system could tip over to the point where they no longer sequester carbon, but instead produce it, thus adding to the acceleration of, of, of the Earth system to these hot out states. So, so you have the human forcing from fossil fuel burning and other carbon emissions, but then you have the situation where the Earth itself can generate more heat by adding carbon from carbon stores, sequestered carbon from carbon stores, and due to changes in the Earth's surface, such as loss of ice sheet reflectivity that pushes, that, that reflects sunlight back into space. So, so when those systems start to change, then you get deeper and deeper into a, a risk situation where you can't really pull yourself out of a hothouse Earth. Now, this paper is recommending what is calling what it is calling an Earth stewardship, where where humans cut their carbon emissions to, to zero or near zero or net negative, learn how to pull carbon out of the atmosphere, and perhaps produce other changes through human activity that result in a stabilized Earth system that avoids the hothouse state. But I'm going to talk about trajectory today. So digging a little bit deeper in trajectory, what, what are the aspects of, of trajectory? And, and you can basically boil it down to present level of carbon dioxide as it relates to, to paleoclimate, the rate at which we are adding more carbon into the atmosphere, the point at which we peak and then begin to reduce carbon emissions, and the point at which we reach zero uh, carbon emissions. So, so there's, there's a temporal aspect in the sense of how soon do we do those things, and there's a volume aspect. There's, there's um, how much carbon we are emitting now, how much carbon we are projected to emit in the future. So let's look at the first part of this. I've talked a bit about this graph from NOAA ESRL, and what it describes is the present state of the Earth system as it relates to total greenhouse gas forcing or, or radiative forcing. And this is can, can be boiled down to a number. It's presently 493 parts per million carbon dioxide equivalent. And if we look at this, if we compare this to paleoclimate, we can get a rough estimate of where we are presently as it compares to past climates. Now, this number is not necessarily a fixed value in that human responses can trim certain aspects of the radiative forcing that we are now experiencing, primarily methane, because methane is a short-lived gas, and if we are able to reduce human methane emissions, then, then this portion of radiative forcing can shrink. And also, if we reduce carbon dioxide emissions to zero rather rapidly, there might be some stabilization in the Earth system that draws in a bit more carbon dioxide and reduces a bit of the net CO2 forcing. But overall, this CO2 equivalent gives us an idea of, of how much warming we, we have locked in and, or, or that we might have locked in over time if this stabilization level, if this level stabilizes or increases. So the second aspect is the total level of carbon dioxide emissions. And this is a, a critical element. The sooner you cut this to zero, the, the better off you are with regards to trajectory. And also, it gives us a context in a geological sense in that presently, for example, we know that human systems are emitting about 10 times what the Earth system has ever emitted. So, so it gives us an idea of how rapidly we are heading to a new hothouse state. And briefly, the third aspect is overall what trajectory we are on based on the various RCP scenarios provided by IPCC and, and what, where we expect to go based on policy. So those are the three that we should think about with regards to trajectories. This is part one. I'll be talking more in part two. Thank you for joining me, and I'll be chatting with you soon.